And one tellurium atom, starting from tellurium-4, was reduced to tellurium-2 and is coordinated by an SS coordination, okay, but in this case, not by the same ligand, but by two ligands, as bridging two ligands. The second bridge between the two ligands is now done by the oxidized ligand. So half of the ligand was used to be oxidized to allow the tellurium to be reduced from the oxidation state 4 to the oxidation state 2. But nickel finally directed this reaction by occupying the central coordination position. So starting with this uh, nice structure, Seiler said, OK, what happens when we change the starting materials? When we go from the oxidation state 4 directly to oxidation state 2, we start with phenyl tellurium iodide. Then there is no need to oxidize half of the molecule. We can take both for coordination. So he made this experiment. And the result is a, let me say, confusing molecule. Confusing simply from the number of atoms. And from this projection, we will not see so much. That's why I have highlighted some of the bonding features that might be interesting. And here we see the central unit around the nickel has not changed. We again find tellurium atom, but this time one, two, three, four of them, bridging the sulfur atoms of the ligands, but the iodine ligand, the iodido ligand, is remained in the story, and it bridges two of the tellurium atoms. So we do not have, in this case, a sulfur-tellurium-sulfur bond. We have the tellurium-sulfur units again bridged by an iodide. This is not an uncommon feature in the tellurium chemistry. Tellurium and iodide are close to each other. They like each other. They, tie, they form very tight covalent bonds. And even long-range interactions between tellurium and uh, iodide are not uncommon. For the nickel situation, nothing changed. In principle, this situation is exactly the same. And we learned from this tellurium examples that we can use our compounds to play with different metal ions. Since the, some of our basic concepts seem to work, not always we end without surprises, as we have seen here. But in principle, uh, we can control the reaction. And so we tried to make these trinuclear compounds that I have predicted in the beginning. It should be possible to coordinate some compounds whenever we are possible to provide metal ions of the correct charge and size and softness or hardness. So our first reactions, Jacob made these reactions, were started with soft and, let me say, octahedral or square planar metal ions. <coughs> metal ions like nickel-2, like palladium square planar, like copper-2, like manganese-2. And we combined them with metal ions which are more hard and which can be coordinated with coordination numbers bigger than 6. Since what we expect here is a coordination 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we have the axial positions left. So 8, 9, or 10 should not be unusual. And we first decided to go to the lanthanide series and to combine the lanthanide series with some of the 3D transition metals, manganese, cobalt, nickel, copper. The reaction were made in a one-pot way. That means we simply unified 
nickel acetate or copper acetate or manganese acetate together with lanthanum chlorides or lanthanum nitrates. Here to learn, this is not the same, since co-ligands play a role. But as long as we use the acetate from the transition metals, then we end in a unique, in a unique composition of compound. We have, finally, dry nuclear compounds, the softer metal ions in the outer sphere with an SO coordination, twice, the harder metal ions, the lanthanide, in the center, with the coordination axially, six, and then we have bridging ligands. When we start with the acetate, we have in the majority of the products always the same structure. We have three bridge, uh, two bridging acetate ligands binding the transition metal with the lanthanide, and we have one more uh, acetate ligand coordinated by dentate to the lanthanide. This type of compounds we have prepared with a huge amount of lanthanides, and the structure is always the same. <clears throat> and here we see the role of the acetate, two of them bridge, and one of them focus to the central uh, lanthanide ion. In this case, it is europium. Here the reaction was with nitrate, and uh, what I mentioned, whenever we started with acetate, it is not so important which salt is used for the lanthanides. When we do not add acetate but chloride, a similar structure type is formed, but it focuses then with bridging chloride or ligands and also uh, some terminal chloride ligands at the lanthanide. The coordination sphere, I forget to comment, of the lanthanide in most of these cases, with this acetate bridges in all cases, is 9. It is a bi-capped square antiprism. It is almost the same coordination environment for the central unit. For the transition metal, it changes from time to time. You have the coordination with the oxygen and sulfur chelate, and you have in this case, of course, by this bridging mode, the coordination with one acetate, and the second unit uh, can be modified. It is in most cases methanol, water, some solvent that we used for the reaction. This type of compounds, these trinuclear compounds, have been isolated for a whole series of rare earth compounds. And we did this research since we were interested in the physical chemistry, the physical properties of this compound. Look, what makes these molecules interesting? We have three metal ions within 7.2 angstroms. The distance between two of them is 3.6 angstroms. And when we, when we can combine many 2 plus and 3 plus ions, so let me say we are interested in the magnetism, then we can combine, as we did here, manganese, two manganese ions, with a gadolinium ion. This would finally form 17 spins, 17 unpaired electrons within seven angstrom. This should be the hell of magnetism, the hell of interactions between the spins of the metal ions. And we were interesting, okay, this time we were very enthusiastic and believe now we will have the solution of the molecular magnets. But we have to learn a lot that this is not so easy and fine-tuning of the structure is necessary to understand any of these magnetic interactions. First, we tried to measure this was possible, but to understand this was not possible, EPR spectra of this compound. I show you some of them. 
This is the gadolinium manganese structure. Well, even at 4 Kelvin, we see an EPL spectrum, no problem. But I can't comment this since I understand simply nothing. Sorry. Uh, I'm not very green in, in EPR spectroscopy. I wrote my PhD with EPR, but this tells me nothing except this is a paramagnetic compound. But this we knew before. The same is with the other compounds. With this manganese brassiodium combination, we have at least a kind of magnetic interaction, hyperfine interactions, maybe due to manganese, but again the same result. I don't understand. Sorry, I cannot interpret. This makes it complicated to comment such in papers, for example. That's why we said, OK, so let's go slowly to the magnetism. Let's study it step by step. That, that means we made series of compounds. We took cobalt ions in the outer sphere and went and took each, two, each second of the gadolinium at, uh, of the uh, lanthanide atoms, made a combination of these compounds, prepared them all, and measured the squid behavior of this compound. And even in this case, we had to learn there is no strict dependence between the, magnet the number of the ions and the magnetic behavior. Some of these compounds behave ferromagnetic, some of them behave antiferromagnetic. There is no strict trend. The explanation is <laughs> so easy that we could have known it better before. The structures are similar, but not the same. And for magnetic interactions, even small changes in the angles change a lot what is in relation with the magnetic interaction between metal ion to metal ion. Since they use the orbitals of the ligand donors for the interaction, and then we change just a few degrees the structure, almost invisible for the X-ray studies. This is a dramatic change for magnetic interactions. So we continue this. Now we make the next series with nickel-2, we then will go to the diamagnetic outer sphere atoms to make it even easier. We made these first trinuclear compounds with lanthanides and some transition metals and could say we have as basic concepts that work the soft and hard acids and bases and the coordination numbers of the atoms. You might be surprised why I did not take iron, why I left it out here. The answer is simple. Iron is not innocent concerning the redox chemistry. Uh, of course, we made a chemistry with iron, and uh, we get redox reactions, interesting reactions. That's why I have the question marks with control. We cannot seriously control in which way the oxidation is done. With iron, it was made in another way that, that we had not yet observed before. When we start with iron 3, sorry, I wrote accidentally here iron 2, and I did not correct from the last talk, and I uh, was uh, aware of this mistake. When we start with iron 3, we end with iron 2, it's one part of the molecule, and the second part is oxidized, but not, now not internally. Now, by combination of two of such dinuclear subunits, we have the disulfido bridge formed between the two units and end with a tetranuclear complex. And to be honest, we do not have the control when this tetranuclear is formed by oxidation, and when a binuclear is formed by an internal oxidation of the ligand system. Let's change the partners. Let's go away from this lanthanide series to another group of hard donor atoms, alkaline and alkaline earth metals. 
they can potentially also be used to be coordinated in the center. Thank you.